I'm Dustin Huffman of the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, and this is Brazil. Come along with me on this series as I tour some of the agricultural areas of Brazil, from Minas Gerais and Brasilia to Mato Grosso and Rio de Janeiro. I will show you the farms, industries, and the people that have forged Brazil into a large player in the global ag marketplace. Well, welcome back to episode three of our series, Chronicling My Trip to Brazil. I'm Dustin Huffman on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. There are so many different crops grown all over the world, whether that's food products, cotton, corn, soybeans, wheat, or whatever. And we all have a few basic things in common. We want to provide the best environment possible for those seeds to be successful. We don't want to prevent them from getting attacked by disease, pests, or even weeds. And we all want to make sure that we've done everything we can that's in our control to make sure that they have the best. And we pray to the good Lord above that he's got the rest that we can't control and looks favorably upon our efforts. But the one thing we have in common and where all those plants start is with one little seed. It's a symbol of everything the farmer works through throughout the whole year. And that is, of course, faith and hope to get through another year and be successful. This hope and faith is everything we cannot control and everything we can control melded together. And you rely on that hope and faith to carry you through for another year. Now that's the same here in the United States where we just got our seeds into the ground. And it's the same elsewhere around the world, including in Brazil. And for today, we're going to go and see one of those seed companies in action. We're going to return to the seed family farm in Minas Gerais. And we're going to learn about Cementis Gaiosha, which is the largest operation in their ag industry that they have. And so we are going to find out more about that. But first, before we get there, on our way to Seep's farm, we learned a little bit about the area in which they grow and which they have their ag operation. So one of the unique features of the Cejado is a lot of the good production areas are basically on top of plateaus. So I don't know if you've kind of noticed what we've been driving up some hills here, uh, increasing our elevation. So we're, uh, much of Carroll's farm is close to 3,000 feet in elevation. And that's one of the reasons I think it's good for seed production. It's good for coffee. Coffee needs high elevation. Um, and so that's that's why there's a lot of coffee production there. So um, for uh, this pl particular plateau that they're on is uh, called uh, Chapadão do São Pedro, which is the uh, like the plateau of St. Peter. So it's named after a Catholic saint. I think St. Peter was maybe among other things, the patron saint of rain. And so that's that's what they call that plateau here. So, um, so we're probably about 15 minutes away from the farm now. Um, so you see a lot, lot, lot of ground. Um, it's a good, good production area here. So why is the fence so far off the road now? They're going to have late planting crops. This is. So someone asked why that fence is planted far away. So technically the, um, the government, if they want, they have a right to take, take that if they want. Um, and so I think that's maybe the reason they put that fence there, but you know, obviously they're not doing anything with it. And so they can still farm right up to the road. And so that's what they do for the most part. But um, so I think the, but yeah, if the, if the, want, the government wanted to, whatever you call it, eminent domain or whatever, wanted to take this in and use it to build up the road or whatever they can. As we get into this feature about Cementus Gaiosha, Caroline starts off by telling us about the history of the seed production part of their family ag operation. The seed business is the core business of the company, and we have been producing soybean seeds since 1976. This was the first product of the company and we produce these soybean seeds for, for a company that's called Brasmax. Brasmax is an Argentinian company 
And we also sell all of the soybean seeds for, for, to different states in Brazil, like Minas Gerais, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, Goiás. We have a seed facility that can uh, storage more than 300,000 bags of soybean seeds. We just built another big warehouse to storage all the seeds. And when you say 300,000 bags, it's the one ton bags. It's the big one. It's not the, the, uh, not the seed bags. The, the seed we're bags saying, we're we probably more up we grew up with. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's a lot of volume. Yeah. Okay. When we arrived in Brazil, farmers were in the midst of the soybean harvest and getting ready to plant what is known as the safrina corn crop. During this time, the facility was going through repairs, maintenance, and all the preparations that go into getting the company ready for another season. Caroline's brother Felipe and Matthew took us around the facility to get us an idea of how it operates. So there's about 20,000 bushel capacity in the dump pit. It's split into three different compartments. So this is where they bring in the soybeans goes through the cleaner here first you have these are drying systems here and then beyond that screens basically behind that that separate by the side of the so you can have a um, consistent bean size that you're selling and all your grain dryers are wood fired grain dryers yes Yes, the gas system is very expensive in Brazil. But you put this in in 2004? Yeah. And it was about one and a half million dollars at the time? Yes. So American or? Dollars, yeah. yeah. I think if you're going to do this, all this stuff in now, maybe it costs four. Maybe, maybe $4 million to replicate this today. You probably heard Felipe and I talking about drying their grains. We're so used to having LP gas or propane available to run our drying systems in the U.S. However, in Brazil, the infrastructure is not there to move that volume of natural gas around the country. It's just too expensive. So to do their grains, they use a wood-fired boiler system. Often you'll see square groves of trees mixed into crop growing areas throughout the country. Those are eucalyptus trees, and they're used primarily for the speed at which they can grow to full height and be harvested for the wood. So what happens next when the seed season comes around? Well, Caroline gives us a rundown of what time of the year they start to get things up and running for another growing season for those farmers. Usually our harvest starts end of February and goes to May. And after we harvest these, we store it in, in that warehouse. And are around like October, September, October, we start to deliver these seeds to the dealers, to the egg dealers. And that season is going to be on them before they know it. Just like here in the United States, the calendar flies rather fast and it's hard to believe that we're in the beginning of another growing season and ready for those plants to take off. And that's been the story of Cementus Gaiosha, well, at a 30,000 foot view. I hope you were able to learn a little bit about what that family does to ensure that they're providing quality seed products for the growers in Brazil. And we're three episodes into this Brazil series. We talked about dairy. We got the overview of the culture and the people. And now we've talked about seeds. And we're just getting started. There's so much more for me to bring you. I thank you so much for coming along on this journey. And of course, we'll ask you to go back, if you've missed any of the uh, previous episodes, to look on our YouTube channel or our other social media outlets. And you can always follow us at iowaagnet.com. We'll be back with you next time on this series for Brazil. I'm Dustin Huffman on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network.